The Museum of Contemporary Art Denver presents Practicing Citizenship, a conversation series featuring artists, activists, and experts exploring civic engagement. Tonight, we bring you Just Us, monologues from the front line of the criminal justice system, produced by Modus Theater. And now, here's Sarah Bai, MCA Denver's Director of Programming. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Bai. I'm the Director of Programming at MCA Denver, and this is Practicing Citizenship program series MCA Denver is producing in conjunction with the exhibition, Citizenship, A Practice of Society. We are coming to you live every Wednesday night throughout the run of the exhibition. And tonight we present Just Us, stories from the front lines of the criminal justice system. Modus Theater creates original theater to facilitate dialogue on the critical issues of our time. In a moment, I'm gonna to turn tonight's show over to our MCs, Tanya and Joaquin. But before I do, I'm gonna thank you all for joining us tonight and for supporting the museum. If you have the means, please consider donating to support MCA Denver. We suggest a donation of $10, which is what we would normally charge for tickets. But of course, any amount helps. And thank you so much for your support. Now I'm pleased to introduce Joaquin Mobley and Tanya Shirez. Joaquin is the Just Us project strategist for MODIS, a Just Us monologuist and the vice president of Community Works. Tanya is the national outreach and education director of MODIS Theater and an undocumented monologue with MODIS Theater's Undocu America project. Please welcome Tanya and Joaquin. Hey, 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 how everybody doing out there in the TV world, YouTube world? Thank you, Sarah, and good evening, everyone. It is great to be with the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver and present Modus Theater's Justice Monologues as part of the museum's powerful exhibit, Citizenship, a Practice of Society. Modus Theater's mission is to create original theater to create community conversation on critical issues of our time. And although the Justice monologists are joining us for the community barber shop in Colorado Springs, most of you from your homes and everyone in different places, we do want to honor today that Colorado stands on the land of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and the Ute. Absolutely. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that it has been an historic day and the first female vice president and the first black and South Asian vice president has been sworn in. But we also know there are going ongoing struggles and fears from the recent insurrection. COVID-19, racism, health and economic fears are having beloved family and friends in prison who are experiencing greater exposure to COVID-19 and yet are not getting priority for vaccination. So before we begin the scheduled programming, sharing stories from Modus's formerly incarcerated monologists, let's go ahead and take three collective deep breaths to ground ourselves. Ready? Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Oh, I think I really needed that. Uh, and to help us ground even deeper, the acapella group Spirit of Grace of Flowbots fame, you may have actually heard them sing the national anthem at the Nuggets game last fall. They're going to sing to remind us all whatever challenges we're feeling, not to give up. And I encourage you while they sing, please write into the YouTube comments section what is grounding you and inspiring you today? And I'll share aloud some of your thoughts. Welcome, welcome. We are Spirit of Grace and uh, we welcome you. And it's so great to be here at the beautiful Museum of Contemporary Art. I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. Oh, I don't believe he brought 
me this far to leave me. I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. Oh, I don't believe. He brought me this far, I don't believe 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 He brought me this far to leave me wow so beautiful thank you spirit of grace and already i see some comments coming in uh definitely what is grounding you and inspiring you today i see uh, listening to the youth poet laurette at the inauguration that of course was so inspiring as well as just knowing that we have our families and our communities uh, going outside into nature and engaging with people that we love. Thank you all for sharing. Absolutely. This evening, we will be sharing four monologues from Modus Just Us Project created in a Modus Monologue workshop with formerly incarcerated leaders in collaboration with Modus Artistic Director, the beautiful Kirsten Wilson. Tonight, you will hear from Astro Allison, Derek Bell, Daniel Guillory, as well as my own story. And in between each monologue, we have the pleasure of listening to more of the musical medicine of Spirit of Grace, who have chosen short musical responses to honor each monologuist and their story. And while they sing to the monologuist, know they are also singing for you. So let their music inspire you so that we can leave tonight more at home in ourselves and ready for the work ahead to support true justice in our community. So while they sing, I will ask you to continue writing in the comments in YouTube, what most impacted you about the story you heard? Absolutely. And now my fellow Modus Justice monologues, Astro Allison, reading his autobiographical monologue entitled Right and Wrong from the Community Barbershop here in Colorado Springs. Enjoy. Hello, my name is Astro Allison, and I'm blessed to be here. I am coming to you virtually from the Museum of Contemporary Art, Denver, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. This is my monologue. The system doesn't make sense. And if you think about it, outside of a lens of racist justification, that says it's normal for one out of three black men to end up going to prison, then you won't understand it either. We work hard, too often at low paying jobs, only to be chased and locked up like exotic beasts. And then we get told you're useless, you're worthless. The system actually does that to you. It is a system without empathy in which they can judge you like they want to. They can enslave you like they want to because you're never really going to be free. Well, maybe some people but not you, not me, not he who has been convicted because now he is lower than his peers or maybe no conviction needed. It's just because you're black. Yes, I am awake to the injustice, the racism, 
the lies, but I am still trapped. They waste us. They use our talent for surviving outside of legal opportunities of economic gain for their entertainment. And I am not entertained. I am not entertained. I want out of the Coliseum, but I am trapped like everyone you see with me here. Even though I have so far escaped the prison game, there's no escape when you come from poverty. Because I am my brother's keeper, if the jail keeper has my brother, then I too am caught like my cousin is caught. You see, my cousin is like my brother. We are all we have. We got arrested for some messed up trespass charge in this small town in Texas. And I knew being in that small white town that it didn't matter that there was a good reason we were there. It just wasn't going to look good regardless. So I paid somebody to get me in front of the DA before the court date. And when I talked to the DA, he dropped the whole case. He got to meet me personally. He got to hear the whole story, got to be surprised by the eloquence of a black man. But he didn't get the chance to meet with my cousin because my cousin had a public defender. It's crazy if their job was really to protect, defend, serve, and give you what you deserve, they would have said to my cousin, I see obviously there's a mismatch here. Let me knock this off. But they didn't say that. Even though we were on the same case and it was dismissed, he still went to jail. He still got parole. And that one event stopped his life for years. He wasn't able to get a job in the area because he couldn't move. And that was where his kid lived. So it instantly made him stuck. He didn't want to crash from house to house. He didn't want to live with his parents, but he has to suck it up, do whatever it takes just to make a buck, just to feed his kid. He's stuck. And seeing his pain is like seeing my pain. Every time I saw him needing something for me, it's like, dang, now I need something too. He needs something, so we need something. Because he's hurting for cash, now we are hurting for cash. Because I'm his brother. And it's not his fault. It's not like he doesn't want to work. He's smarter than a lot of people that are in college. And he can't even finish his degree because he's too far away from a school. He doesn't have a computer and stuff like that. And it sucks because some people are just given that shit and they waste it. I see these white kids all around me getting their tuition paid for by their parents, getting their dorms paid for by their parents, getting food, money, cars, extravagant things, you know, luxuries that my people wouldn't even dream about. And everywhere there's this moral lecture coming from the criminal and justice system, coming from the school system, the media about knowing right from wrong. And I'm working my job and going to college, hoping that, that will get me out of poverty. But really what are my chances of making it out? Because statistically, black men don't make it up the income ladder. For us, there's rarely any ladder. Just a lot of unexpected slides in the prison. So don't lecture me on doing it right. Don't you dare lecture me. I grew up watching my mom struggle after doing everything right. She is noble. She is fierce. A black woman impregnated with me at 16 and still managed to graduate from high school. And my grandmother, she too also a single parent, the product of foster care. She did the best she could for my mom, 
and my mom would wash clothes, work at a daycare. So there was a place for me while she drove 60 minutes every day to get to a college where she could get that degree, an advanced degree, so she could become an elementary school teacher. And when she moved back to her hometown with her expensive degree and wanted to work for the same elementary school that she had once attended, she was turned down for the teaching position because they said she was underqualified. They told her she could be a teacher's aide, an aide. You know that hard work we lectured you on when you were a kid attending this elementary school? You know that education we told you that you had to get in order to prove your worth? It's worthless to us. Get back to the field where you belong. Well, she didn't go back to the field. And she got out of the whole education field itself because the next school in town that she applied to told her the opposite. They told her she was overqualified. And maybe it's good she got out of the whole education field. There's no money in it. Here in Colorado, we spend $7,000 a year on each student's public education. And we spend $39,000 a year incarcerating each inmate. The whole game makes no sense. It makes no sense. Thank you. Thank you, Astro. And while Spirit of Grace sings their musical response, please share a few thoughts into the YouTube comments about what most impacted you as you heard Astro Allison's story and hear Spirit of Grace. Astro, we hear you, we feel you, we love you. Yes, we do. We know that your mother has fought we know that you have fought, and we want you to keep going and keep your eyes on the prize. Mm, one thing we did right was the day we started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Freedom is his name. It's going to be our claim to fame. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Hold on. Sing, keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, we'll keep up this fight until they do us right. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Hold Fight, Nastro. We believe in you. 
And we're back. Thanks, Spirit of Grace. Um, always a pleasure listening to you, ladies. Um, it always grounds me. Uh, as mentioned previously, my name is Joaquin Mobley. I am the Vice President of Community Works as well as a, a serial entrepreneur, and I am a monologuist. Um, so without further ado, uh, we're going to go through my autobiographical monologue called Unhirable. Enjoy. It's late fall, 2002 and I'm 18 years old. I'm full of strength and light. I tripped all the way from Washington Heights in Manhattan to Flushing, Queens, the last stop on the seven train. I was down to my last. I traveled home to Home Depot to be interviewed for a job. I was filled with hope, but I was cloaked in desperation. I walked in to meet my potential new employer. His name was Sheldon. We interviewed and I killed it. I mean, I killed it. I'm absolutely sure Sheldon felt my hunger. I detected his Caribbean accent and I tried to find common ground, being that my father was from that part of the world. And I, too, was raised in that culture of hard work, discipline and determination. He bought in on me working there. He told me how much I was going to love the job and, you know, that I would make good money. So. You know, Sheldon went through the, the the natural processes. He took my social security number and then he stepped behind his desk to run it through a system. At that time, I would not let myself feel anything but confident as he typed in the nine digits that would ultimately determine my possibilities. I insisted on the image of him returning to me with his hand held out, ready to shake, and that I would return to my abuela with the reassurance of a new job. I mean, I had to see earlier that morning, the stakes had been raised. I had been startled awake. The sound of bachata music, sobbing, police, sirens, and, you know, the soft conversation between two individuals outside my building discussing the terms and condition of the pre-purchase of narcotics. But that's not what woke me. See, for me, that noise of my neighborhood had become my background music. And actually, in a real weird way, it helped me sleep better. I could usually drown out even the loudest of those sounds. But that morning had been different. Something was wrong. Something was obviously off. See, there was no sweet, beautiful aroma of fried yucca, eggs and, and onions that my abuela makes for me and my abuelo every morning. Nor did I hear the sound of Telemundo coming underneath my bedroom door. When I opened the door to my room, still halfway asleep, I discovered that the sobbing sound that I had grown immune to was coming not from outside, but from inside. It was coming from our family living room. It was my abuela who was sobbing. I ran to her side and kneeled down in front of her. ¿Qué estás pasando, abuela? She handed me two letters, one from my abuelo stating that he would not receive his social security for another year and another from public housing informing my grandparents that because I was on probation for a felony drug conviction, I had to leave my home or my entire family would be evicted, regardless of my age or what I was going through at the time. You know, it's truly amazing what a day brings and takes from us in our poverty stricken communities. You know, it was like just the night before I had a feeling of stability and hope. After all, I had an actual interview for a job. Do you know how many applications an 18 year old black man has to fill out before they are even considered for an interview? It was going to happen. My baby's mothers needed money for diapers and food. And now I was going to have it. But now looking at those letters and my well of sobbing. The challenge was overwhelming. I didn't need just enough to support my kids and, you know, to start college. I now needed enough for rent, uh, security, uh, utilities, you know, you name it. I needed it or simply hold the possibility of being homeless. And I had to figure out how to help my well pay her rent with no so Social Security coming in. So once again, Despite the vision that I had gathered for myself in jail of getting a job, uh, making it to college and, you know, just staying out the drug game in trouble overall, I was having to consider going back into it and possibly risking my freedom as well as my life. See, 
in the last year, I had already lost two friends murdered over rivalry for selling territory. The drug game is a cold game. Trying to stay strong for my abuela, I kissed her and walked away to prepare for my interview at Home Depot in a new state of mind. One now heavy with threat and despair. But you can't let people see that and think they will hire you. I showered and dressed and used every item of clothing I put on to build me up, to regain my hope, so I could get on that train and feel it all somehow working out. So back at Home Depot, there I was sitting in Sheldon's office. I was practically praying and chanting when his head finally reemerged from behind his computer screen. But by just looking at his face, I could tell immediately that everything had changed. I was now dead to him, or at least untouchable. He wouldn't even look at me. The numbers had rolled out, and I was officially unhirable. I mean, I started talking fast, trying to regain my ground. I told him I could be on a probationary period or, you know, something like that. I told him that I needed this job for my kids. I shared what I was up against economically. He was unmoved, and his response to my sob story was just, sorry. But I was not going home without a job. Please, Sheldon, listen. I'm trustworthy. I'm an honorable man. I'm asking for a shot, an opportunity, and a chance. He just looked at me impervious to what I was going through and asked that I leave the premises. I left not only Home Depot, but I left New York. My mom lived out in Colorado Springs, and I hoped to find work through her connections and stay out of the drug game completely. When I got to Colorado, I was surrounded by plenty of job offers. None of them were legal. I bet you all didn't know that according to the Brookings Institute, a black man without a criminal record is less likely to get called back for a job than a white man who checked the felony box. Ridiculous. So. In 2006, I went to prison and I was given twice the time for the same crime as the two white men who went up in front of the judge before me. That startled me awake, even more than the cries of my abuela. I was awake and angry with the injustice of it and fierce with an intention of alchemy. To take all that still concrete and brutality and disregard they gave me as DOC number 147 388 and turn it into my own armor. I may have to fight to survive, but I will not be your entertainment. I am not your victim, and I will not let you make me your victim. Every day I gave myself a new challenge to help me keep my focus and sanity. First, I built up my chest, I built up my biceps. Then I learned how to read and write in the language of my abuelos, Spanish. After that, I learned to read Arabic the language of the black leaders in prison who were resisting with self-respect, self-love, and prayer. I re-enrolled in college and got several certifications, despite all the obstacles to getting my education in prison. And even with that arsenal of strengths, it was hard to stay out of prison. See, when I was released, I had just $10 in my pocket, I had no clothes, and at that time, no hope. I almost didn't make it despite my nearly 10 years of preparing for that very moment. But I did, and I'm here. And now I work to support other people coming out of our prison system, guiding them as they take the skills they learn in illegal economies and transform themselves into entrepreneurs with legal opportunities. Because this system wastes our brilliance. Thank you. And while Spirit of Grace sings their musical response, to Joaquin's story, please share a few thoughts in the YouTube comments about what most impacted you as you heard Joaquin Mobley's story. Here's Spirit of Grace. Joaquin, we hear you. We understand and we support you. Yes, we do. We want you to keep moving because you are powerful and you are wonderful to those who you help. We want you to hold on without getting weary. Hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. Everything will 
be your eyes. Everything will be your eyes. Fight on, oh, just a little while longer. Oh, fight on, just a little while longer. We need you to fight on, just a little while longer. Oh, everything will be all right. Everything will be all right. Won't you pray on just a little while longer? Pray on just a little while longer. You got to pray on just a little while longer. Oh, everything will be alright. Everything will be alright. Everything will be alright. We love you, Joaquin. Thank Keep you. Keep fighting for us, baby. Thank you. Wow. Always refreshing to hear them, the ladies, especially after I read uh, my monologue. Uh, definitely keeps me grounded. Um, now, uh, we're going to shift gears and we're going to go into the next monologuist, uh, Mr. Derek Bell. He will be reading his Just Us story, Belly of the Beast. Enjoy. Um, I'm, I'm going to dedicate this to uh, a recently longtime friend of mine, Brian Bean, who just passed away um, just past week. So I don't know what led me there. It was 2 a.m. I was in my car parked across from the prison. I know I was driving to the prison until I actually arrived. And I didn't know I was praying until I finally heard in my own words, stay solid and stay solid. Now, I've been out of prison for the, over five years now. It is easy to go back in there. So many ways, I'm not going back. But sometimes on the street, I'll walk by somebody and smell, smell jail. And it's like, I'm right back inside, but I have to pull myself together. Most people who spent any time in prison, we never know when we fall asleep if our dreams will take us back. We wake up screaming and open our eyes, hoping to see that the nightmare is over. We were spat out from the belly of the beast back into the streets, but that beast is now inside our belly and we do the best we can because we never know what that day would bring. I know I never wanted to be a gang member. I never wanted to be associated with drug dealing. I never looked up to that stuff, not at all, but I ended up putting my energy into the wrong person. Now back in 2002, you know, I was just out of high school, working full time at a computer school, going to college in computer science. And when I got a call from this guy that I met in my early days, you know, we met in the commissary, back in groceries, and when our parents were actually in the military. <laughs> and as friends do, we latched on to each other. We would go to parties together back in high school, and you know, there would be times that we get into fights. I fight his fights. I literally fight his fights. And not because I thought he was going to get beat up, but because I wanted to show him that you got a brother, you know, with you, you know, that camaraderie, you know what I'm saying? I guess I always, to be, I always wanted to be like my dad, you know? My dad is intense. He fight for you. You look for looking at him wrong. And at the same time, he give you everything to you. Loyalty. He was strong. He fought with his brothers, for his brothers in the army. When my old friend called, I hadn't seen him in years. But when he showed up, it was like we were right back with each other. Those were some of the best times of my life. We were inseparable, even dated women that were friends. So he wanted some help with his business. I was all about it. I had the computer and accounting skills to make all the money from the drugs. 
hide. And we're selling everything. I wasn't planning on getting the drug trafficking, but I turned my world from something legit to a throw off of my friend. And well, of course, for the love of money, we're young. You hear all the time about the addict, how addictive drugs are, but we don't talk about how addictive drug selling is. In that year, 2003, I went from ashy to class, from counting pennies to having rolls of hundreds in my pockets, from driving a 1998 Toyota Camry to driving a 2000 GMC Envoy, from being treated by like the world, like no, from to be treated like a nobody, pretty much, to a somebody. I'm just coming out of high school, and there's no longer a teacher, a coach asking good questions about what I'm up to, because they know you. They know you want to build something gracious. Do you want drugs to be involved? Of course not. No, I didn't want drugs to be involved because I knew it was going to harm people. But the money, just like the drugs, it's an addiction. And because I wasn't selling drugs myself, I could put it behind me. Like, okay, I'm not going to worry about the people harming themselves. I want to make sure that me and him put our money in the right places where we are able to help invest in the community. So one morning he calls and tells me that he's getting a little paranoid about the people he's meeting at Walgreens parking lot. He thinks they're going to rob him. He says, man, can you cover me? I've been covering him since we was kids. His fights are our fights. I was arrested. And in the process, I was shot by the police and tried to run. They ran me over in a truck and my foot got caught in the axle, almost pulled off. And when they handcuffed me on the gurney, and as I lay on that hospital bed, they interrogated me, trying to get information on him. They didn't care I was in intensive care. I refused to say anything. And for the lack of information that I did not provide, they pretty much gave me the hammer. I thought by keeping silent, I was saving, you know, my friend's life. I saved him and a number of people who are work who work with us, you know, from that going to prison. And I took everything they were going to change every charge everybody with. I just took all those cases and put them on me. On the notion that if he was in that same spot, he'll do the same thing. It was only later I discovered that he did set me up. The case was all on him, but he knew if I showed up and stayed to him at the Walgreens parking lot, they put it all on me. I was not charged as an accountant on the state case but labeled as a mastermind drug dealer, trafficking, ultimately sending me to a federal housing. And that is the fact that I was, excuse me, and is the fact that I was guilty of hiding a major drug screen. I had misplaced my loyalty and courage on the wrong person for the wrong ends. And I had been lured into denial by money and the desire for a true brother. I had hurt people by selling drugs to my community of that, I was guilty. But why is it that I can be sent away for a decade on a nonviolent drug charge, and yet the DA and the prosecutors who sent me into that prison of violence and assault are presumed innocent? Because they know what is going to happen to you, in it. They know what is going to happen. I knew nothing about surviving those environments and no damn prison politics. I didn't know nothing about that. But I did know if you come and attack me, if you put me in that center of brutality and assault me, I'm going to beat the hell out of you just for my protection. Not because I wanted to show off. I wasn't into violence for violence. I was a ball player, man. You know what I'm saying? I was a computer science student, just a man to man fighter, as my dad would teach me, you know. But they sent me into that evil place, and it's crazy in there. One minute, there's a group of men standing in a circle, and then, damn, he got his eye took out. Damn, you know what I'm saying? He got hit with a lock in the sock. It was hell. It was hell going in there. I don't want to be slammed into a concrete desk. I don't want to be raped. I don't want to kill nobody, but I don't want to be killed neither. Every chance I got, I was calling my mom. I was calling her crying. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I was on my own in the feds. No gang, no protection. So a few men tried to number me up and they got me in the cell. I looked at all of them and said, someone's about to get hurt. Someone's about to get messed up. But, you know, one of them still ran in on me. And by the time he did, I did what I needed to do to survive. And if a correction officer had not seen enough what would happen, 
and those officers be willing to speak up for me and say it was self-defense, I will be in prison right now for attempted murder still. And even though I was determined not guilty, the criminal justice system still took my innocence away because they put me in a position where to survive, I had to stab a man in the neck and his blood was just pouring out on his body all over me. Very numb feeling. And it would be ultimately the thought of me saying, this should, should be all over the judge too, the DA and the prosecutors, them too. And that's not the worst of it, far from the worst. Do you know how much this system actually kills white, black, Mexican, kills them mentally. You know, by being good kids, whatever, not really that much training, they get sent to these evil environments on one mistake. And by sending them to these prisons, they have already killed someone, but the DAs, prosecutors, judges don't get that charge for that. It's not just the inmates. What do you think happens to the corrections officers? At one point, it was their first time seeing it, their first stabbing, their first rape. You watch the new ones, what we call the green ones. How the longer they are there, the farther they are from their selves. They become lost as well. They become lost too. We're all locked up in the belly of the beast. And when you leave that beast, it is inside your belly too. And then they point at you and they judge you and say, look, that's a pit bull. He's dangerous. He bites. Look at this prison file. He's a monster. And they take no responsibility for throwing you to that pit. No accountability, no responsibility. Well, myself, I take the responsibility. And what I have to do to not to lose myself or give them an excuse to send me back. And I pray for me and everyone in that prison. Stay solid. Stay solid. Because we are not their beasts. We are unknown to them in mental capacity and ability to, to adapt. Deep inside us, we are sharp business owners, entrepreneurs, multitaskers, loyal brothers, and strong fathers. It is true, the beast we've been fed may be in our belly. And, you know, it is hard to control at times. But with the necessary amount of guidance, power, and love, our true spirit will emerge beyond its teeth. And that spirit is not impulsive. It is not reactive. It is our true purpose in broken pieces put together by experience and only gets stronger by the day of new learning. Stay solid. Stay solid. I'm praying for you. I'm really praying for you, man. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek, for sharing your monologue. And now, while Spirit of Grace sings their musical response, please share a few thoughts on the YouTube comments about what most impacted you as you heard Derek Bell's story. Hear Spirit of Grace. Hello, Derek. We hear your story. We hear your testimony. And we believe you. You know, it's not every day that you can fight for something that you believe in as you have done. But we respect that. And we appreciate you as our brother. He is my king. king. He is my one. one. Yes, he's my father. Yes, he's my son. I can talk to him because he understands everything, everything I go through and everything, everything I am. He's my support system. Oh. Can't live without him. Yeah. The best thing since sliced bread is his kiss, his touch, his lips, his hugs. And, and I, I just, just want, want the whole world to know. About my black brother, I love you. I'll never try to hurt you. I want you to know that I'm here for you forever, true. Cause you're my black brother, strong brother. There is no one above you. I want you to know that I'm here for you forever, true. Cause you're my ooh, 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 ooh. every one of y'all. We love you, Derek, <laughs> baby. Stay strong. Man, I love that song. And now we have a special treat. Uh, the monologue is Daniel Guillory reading his monologue. Enjoy. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Daniel Guillory, and my autobiographical monologue is called Truth, Not Facts. The last time I went to jail, I had been in there for about 18 months while I was fighting my case. I called my mom. I said, yo, mom, they dropped all the holes I can bond out. You guys want to bond me out? She said, well, let me talk to your sisters and see if we can come up with the money. And she talked to both of my older sisters and they said, now nah, ma, he's up to the same old thing. He's gonna get out and go right back to the drugs. So we ain't in it. But my sweet mother said, well, I'm gonna come and get you. She went and got a loan and she came and bonded me out of jail. I was strong in the word and I meant what I said. I was done with crack. After my mom bailed me out, I went to pick my car up that had been impounded while I was in jail. Right before they arrested me, they had searched my car. I mean, tore it up. They tore it up. I had a nice Cadillac and they pulled out everything that could be pulled out. And they had found no dope in the car. I was finally arrested for what they had found in my house. I drove my car home. I was slowly putting the insides of it back together when I found the pipe right under the front seat with a big old rock right next to it. Clear as day. And I'm thinking, are they trying to set me up? I mean, they had searched my car up and down, even looked in my spare tire. And the dump was right there under the front seat, just as clear as day. I picked up that rock and the pipe and I put it in my pocket. I said to myself, no, I'm not gonna do it. But I didn't throw the doggone thing away. I knew I should have just thrown it away, but I didn't. Later on that day, I broke it up and I hit that thing. Man, and boy, did Scotty beam me up. Soon as I got beamed up, here comes mama. I mean, as soon as I took that hit, not 20 seconds later, she came home and saw me. I saw the tears in those big old brown eyes and I said, oh, mom, I bet if you'd have known this, you'd have left my ass in there. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes. She said, no, baby, I still would have come and got you. Sometimes when I tell the story, still to this day, it brings up such vibrant emotions and it makes me want to weep, just recalling those words. No, baby, I still would have come and got you. Oh, my God, you could have kicked me or cussed me out. But that kind of blatant love makes you butt naked, raw, vulnerable. There's no defense. It makes you defenseless. Anything else I could have handled? Come on, bring it on. You're a liar, a failure, an addict. You're worthless, a criminal. Is that all you got? Yeah, come on, I can stand up to that. But love and grace will lay you out butt naked, no clothes on. Oh my God. That was what made me think differently. That was the pivotal point that led me to being drug free today. That's the thing we got to convey to society. It's when a person least deserves love. That's when they need it the most. And that grace thing, that will give people the 360 degree turn that they need right there. The key is helping people remember their importance, understand their magnificence and invest in helping them to reach their potential instead of punishing them. But the criminal justice system takes all of our shortcomings and our faults 
and it magnifies them. That's all they look at. They take the smaller part, they take the smallest part of us and make it the biggest part of our existence. When all this good stuff is sitting right there, just waiting, it's dormant. It's waiting to grow, but it's never been put in the right environment. And then instead, they send us down a dark tone to a place of violence at every intersection. A gladiator school where you learn how to place magazines around your belly in case someone tries to stick you. You learn always to step out of your pants when you sit on the toilet in case you're attacked. Because in those kind of places, they get you when you're most vulnerable. And when you act out in that violence, they send you further down into a hole where there are no people, just an overflow of toilets and rats and isolation. If you drop an oak tree seed in a concrete world, it's still alive and vibrant, but it's not gonna grow. It's just dormant. But you take that same seed and you drop it in a decent place where there's enough sun and earth and nutrients. You don't even have to plant it. Just put it somewhere where it can possibly grow. And that thing will take off on its own. The fact is, all of us in prison are human beings who committed crimes, but that's not our truth. We are not ontologically criminals. This is not our essence. Instead of helping us return to the full truth of who we are, the criminal justice system takes away our names, gives us DOC numbers, robs us of our dignity and freedom and happiness, and most of all, the potential to be the best selves that we could have been had someone tried to nurture us instead of neuter us. And how can it change as long as the justice system continues to lie about what it is doing to us? They give us a piece of paper that says, the court is sentencing the defendant to incarceration for 10 years of rehabilitation and is fitted towards that sentence. Rehabilitation, my ass. There is no rehabilitation in that place. When you send us to the Department of Corrections, you're essentially making us more incorrect. There's not a sliver of corrections in that place. Those of us telling our stories of the Justice Project are fairly new to this whole idea of restorative justice. But we know that telling the truth and taking responsibility for the harm that we have caused is a big part of it. And we have reflected as a group in our writing, processing on that harm. But we are also asking the criminal justice system itself to sit in this circle with us and hear the ways that we have been harmed because it itself has been criminal in the name of justice. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing your story. And now remember that when Spirit of Grace sings their musical response, you can share a few thoughts in the YouTube chat about what most impacted you as you heard uh, Daniel Guillory's monologue. Here's Spirit of Grace. Hello, Daniel. You know, we hear your story. You have come so far and overcome so many things that people fall and fail at every day. And for that, we applaud you. We celebrate your victories. And we want to say that it's so beautiful, the love that your mother had for you. As a matter of fact, we want you to know that we have love for you too. Although we hope the song offers some kind of medicine for yourself and for your life and for your soul, we also know that the strongest medicine is love. Love, a word that comes and goes, but few people really know what it means to really love somebody. Love. 
Though the tears may fade away, I'm so glad your love will stay. Cause I love you and you show me, Jesus, what it really means to love. The nights that I cried, you love me. When I should have died, you love me. I'll never know why you love me. It's a mystery to me now. I'm glad to see Jesus. When all hope was gone, you love me. You gave me a song because you love me. Now I can go on because you love me. It's a mystery to me now. I'm glad to see Jesus. And now I know what it really means. What it really means. What it really means to love. We love you, Daniel. Stay strong. Thank you so much to Spirit of Grace for just gracing us with your musical inspiration to keep moving towards justice. It was absolutely beautiful. And of course, thank you to the courageous justice monologuists sharing their truth to transform the criminal legal system. I uh, want to highlight some of the powerful reactions to the monologues that you were writing into the comments. Um, I saw that for Astro Allison, some of the comments highlighted the injustice of never being qualified, but always underqualified or overqualified. And not to mention the very real spending of $7,000 per student versus $39,000 per inmate dichotomy. For Joaquin, <clears throat> excuse me, the comments highlighted how we clearly push formerly incarcerated people into illegal activity by locking them out of legal opportunities and also understanding the feeling of wanting something so badly, but it being just out of reach due to the system. For Derek Bell's monologue, I saw uh, people commenting about how the system breaks people's souls and then doesn't take any responsibility for pe putting people in danger. And finally, for, for Daniel's story, I saw you know, highlighting the question of what it would be like to have our own faults magnified to be the biggest part of our existence. And on the flip side, the, the importance and the power of love. Absolutely. We now have a few minutes for audience questions for the Just Us monologues. Myself and uh, Astro Allison are delighted to answer your questions. Thank you, Astro, for joining us. Thank you. I'm Astro Allison and I'm blessed to be here. So um, everybody out there in uh, the YouTube world, uh, please go ahead and submit your questions into the YouTube comments. While we wait for you to submit those, we thought we we thought you might want more facts and information about the criminal justice system and how you can be an agent for change. In the comments, you will find a link to action suggestions that organizations working on reforming the criminal justice system recommend. Great. So I know that while people take their time to start asking questions, one of the questions that always comes up is, you know, what was the process of writing these stories, of coming up with these monologues? What was that journey like for each of you? Well, for me in particular, um, I would say it was definitely a cathartic experience. Um, it was a time for growth. Um, I had a lot of things that, uh, due to the environments that I, I came from, I had to really push down and, and, and really couldn't show them be because of the fear of that it would expose a weakness. And as a result of that, I was able to, um, through this experience of putting my monologue together, um, share some of that and grow from it and, and just feel comfortable with expressing myself. For me, it was a very emotional process. Uh, I want to say it felt longer than it really was. It felt like years, but we definitely bonded. I gained a new family and I actually learned a lot about myself. 
Yeah, absolutely. I uh, experienced the monologue workshop in a different workshop because I was in the Undocu America series. So I can relate to it feeling just incredibly long and, and sort of rehabilitating in its own small way with your own community. Um, I see one question asks, how did you find Modus Theater? Well, uh, for me, uh, actually, I was introduced by Joaquin. Um, I actually come to the barbershop very often. It's one of the best barbershops, if not the best barbershop in Colorado Springs. But he actually introduced me to it, and I was all gung-ho for it. So I came in 100%, and here we are. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was actually introduced by uh, Lynn Lee, who is the Senator Pete Lee's wife. Um, she trained me in restorative justice and essentially just uh, let me know that by sharing my story with Kirsten and um, Kirsten helping me develop it, um, it would give a lot more context around what restorative justice is and how it could really help uh, mobilize and empower our communities. So um, I was definitely introduced by uh, uh, Lynn Lee and uh, uh, there was a couple of other people that played a part in me getting involved in this project as well. Well, from the audience perspective, we're super happy to have heard your stories. Um, it does provide context and it is really important to put them out there. So thank you. Thank you for, for being willing to join such a journey. Um, I see another question that asks, what do you think of Governor Polis not prioritizing vaccinations for inmates when they can't actually socially distance? Me, for me in particular, who I, I was actually incarcerated for the better half of a decade, um, knowing how in close contact we are with one another and that we can't social practice social distancing, um, I definitely think it's an error on his behalf. Um, what holds in my mind is the fact that a lot of individuals could be there on a parole violation or for um, an F6, which is the lowest felony you can have in the state of Colorado. So something not necessarily, uh, um, I guess, life altering, but something that will put you in prison uh, can actually become a death sentence, right? So it's a critical error on his behalf. I definitely think getting the vaccinations in there um, is uh, very important uh, and something that we should definitely try to uh, push him towards, um, you know, by whether it's voting or, you know, getting a call to action or something, because there's going to be a lot of uh, innocent people dying because of this um, in the sense that they were there um, on a PV or they could have been in county jail uh, for something as petty as a traffic offense and now became now has became a death sentence. It's ridiculous. Uh, to second Joaquin, I agree. It's definitely a bad move. Uh, for me personally, I have two uncles uh, federally incarcerated right now, and uh, they're definitely on my mind in my prayers. And um, we got to get help. We got to get more vaccines. And they definitely need to go to the people that need them most, which are all of us. Yeah, absolutely. And it clearly highlights the intersection of so many issues, right? Like not just the criminal legal system, but also healthcare and access to resources for sure. There's a few other questions popping up. So I wanna make sure we get to those. One of them uh, is from a teacher uh, who's teaching on issues about criminal justice system. So what specifically do you think white rural students need to know about this issue? Or more broadly, just how can they help bring about change? What would be your advice to people? Ooh, that's a, a great question. Um, uh, for um, a lot of our allies and, and friends in the rural communities, um, what I think um, they can do to, to help is just speak about it, right? Uh, conversation rules the nation. So with that in mind, by them speaking about the injustices that are going on, uh, taking part in um, uh, uh, marches, um, and something else that um, a lot of people don't talk about, just supporting um, uh, black owned or brown owned businesses um, that are supporting the cause. Right. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do, but specifically just speaking about it um, definitely keeps the conversation going and invites change. I agree. Uh, word of mouth 
obviously is the number one form of communication, uh, but you should also share this with your friends, you know, your family, the people that you want in your circle, the people that you're actually interacting with, tell those people and make sure that we're all like-minded going into 2021. Absolutely. And thank you for, for highlighting that Astro, that oftentimes when people think about changing the narrative or like having conversations, we think about, you know, finding people who are elsewhere. When in reality, sometimes the conversations start a lot closer to home with our friends or family members, the people we see like really frequently. So that's important. Um, I want to answer one question that asks how people can get involved. And I think we highlighted that it's super important to share these narratives. So if you are interested in hearing more stories from other justice monologists, you can visit modistheater.org. Um, but there's also a fact sheet, fact sheet, that was hard to say, link in the, in the YouTube comments where you can look up more information about some of the partner organizations that are already doing amazing work like the ACLU, uh, CCRJC, the Colorado uh, Criminal Justice Coalition, the NAACP, and I'm sure there's many, many more. Uh, so definitely look into that. Um, and then the final question before we, we sort of wrap up today, can you tell us, is sharing your stories with us repeatedly healing or painful or both? Asher, you can go. All right. <laughs> so personally, it is both. It is healing and it is painful. It's a painful truth, but honestly, I'd rather bear the truth and know the difference that it's making and the healing that I get from it is good enough for me to continue on and keep doing this program. Absolutely. Uh, for me, um, I guess I got a kind of different answer. Um, initially, it was very painful uh, for me um, to uh, really um, you know, actually do the actual reading uh, in front of big crowds um, just because I felt like I was being vulnerable. Uh, and in the environments, as I mentioned previously, um, that I come from, um, showing those vulnerabilities can, you know, in fact, cost you your life. Uh, but once I grew out of that, uh, due to uh, Kirsten Wilson helping me develop my monologue as well as my confidence, um, relaying my story and articulating it um, became a real cathartic experience, as I mentioned previously uh, as well. Um, so for me, it was it, it's it's medicine, right? It's medicinal. Um, and it, it keeps me uh, grounded and it consistently reminds me uh, of where I came from to where I'm at now. So for me, it, it, it's empowering. Thank you both so much for sharing your answers with us. And I'm sure people would have so many more questions, but we only have so much time in the day. So thank you for being here today. And um, I do wanna say thank you to our wonderful audience with your questions. Uh, they were great. And of course, to our monologues for just being willing to answer our questions. Um, on behalf of Modus Theater, we want to again thank our Modus monologues, Astro Allison, who is here today, Derek Bell, Daniel Guillory, and Modus's powerful contributing artists, including our own artistic director, Kirsten Wilson, and singer Spirit of Grace, who are beautiful. And of course, my co-host and fellow monologues, Joaquin Mobley. And thank you to the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver for including us in their exciting citizenship, a practice of society exhibition that continues until February 14th. Thank you so don't, much for the platform. Yeah, don't miss it, y'all. It's going to be great. So uh, that's it. Goodbye from Modus Theater. Thank you all. We appreciate you spending your evening with us and expressing civic hospitality by listening deeply to the experiences of our justice monologists. So together, let's work to revision and just idealize a new justice in our country. I want to uh, now send it back to the museum's director of programming, Sarah Bay. <laughs> I wanna thank all of you for joining us tonight for this conversation. Thank you, Modus Theater. Thank you, Spirit of Grace. Thank you, Joaquin, Tanya, and Astro, and all the monologists, monologists. And thank you for watching at home. Citizenship programs will return next Wednesday when Peter Miles Bergman and Heather Link Bergman will talk to us about their leftist leaflets in little libraries. Thank you for tuning in and have a great night.